Well, what a blessing to celebrate this morning our 18th anniversary since the beginning. We be- Some of you don't know this, but we began in a hotel conference room in Highlands Ranch, and we just all gathered there with hearts that were so unified to seek the face of God and put His name on display in our local assem- assembly. And, w- and we have tasted of His grace so richly. His lampstand is in our midst, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I love it so. I love it so. So I've been thinking about what to preach on as we celebrate our anniversary this morning, and just so many different thoughts came to mind. But then one came and really stuck with me and kind of screamed at me. It was like neon lights were going off, and even someone as dense as me finally caught on. This is it. This is it. What would encompass all that this day means to me, this passage hit everything that I had on my heart. And so what I would like to do this morning, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want to teach on the Lord's Supper, and then we will go to the communion table together. So I want to instruct us on the Lord's Supper. The last time I did this, I think, was almost 16 years ago. That's way too long. So this morning, we will, as a church family, listen, learn, grow, and then we will do this in remembrance of me together to picture the beauty of the body of Christ. So let's go to our beautiful Lord, and let's pray and prepare our hearts for this table. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you that he's the radiance of your glory, the exact representation of your nature. God, we have seen his beauty, and we've tasted it. I thank you for the testimonies that we heard of how the body of Christ, looking to Christ, has caused these two to grow up into Christ. Lord, we thank you for this. I pray now as we uh, open again to understand the Lord's table, God, I pray that you would give us a fresh look at it, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to behold the beauty of what you have prepared and designed in the Lord's table. And then I pray as we remember that you'll meet us in a very special way. God, that we, by the eyes of faith, we would look our eyes out at Jesus Christ this morning and you would do mighty things in our hearts as we look at him. And so, Lord, put... Put your son on display now in this season together, we pray in his precious name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11. I'm afraid that the the church in the West has lost sight of the gloriousness and the beauty of what Jesus has left for us when he instituted the Lord's table. I just want to bring a little history as we begin this morning. In 1555 to 1558, during the reign of Queen Mary, who was later known as Bloody Mary. 288 Protestant reformers were burned at the stake. Some of the more famous ones were Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, who set this, who were, while they were being burned, they proclaimed the glory of God. Thomas Cramner, Roland Taylor, there were many who were killed, even children for their faith. And they were burned because they didn't believe the communion wafer became the real presence of the body of Jesus Christ at the table. If they would not admit to the Catholic Church's teaching on transubstantiation, they were literally burned by Queen Mary at the stake. Many more were martyred for their stance on baptism. And so I'm very glad that the separation of church and state has shut down some of those horrific acts. I'm glad that we don't kill Pato Baptists, but I've met a few Baptists who have in speech. There was a time in the church when baptism and the Lord's Supper were very serious business, they would actually die for it. The fault of that era was brutality and pride, but I think the fault of our era is superficiality, which can be just as dangerous. I wonder what we would actually die for today, what things we would give our lives for uh, to hold to at all cost in the body of Christ. My prayer then is that we as a church would treasure what God has given us in the Lord's table There's a depth and a beauty that I think we're just skimming the surface of what there is for us. And so I want you to dig in with me this morning and open it up, and then we'll remember together. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, said this, The Lord's Supper is the commemoration of the greatest blessing that ever the world enjoyed. I I pray that we would all say that at the end of this morning. The Lord's Supper is the commemoration of the greatest blessing that ever the world enjoyed. This morning, how I want to look in 1 Corinthians 11 is I want to look at four connections that the Lord's table is intended to give us as we partake together. 
So the first connection I want to look at is that it connects our present to our past. Look with me in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. So there's a definite article on in the night. So it was the night, in, in the literal Greek, is while he was being betrayed. And what was that night? What was the night? Is there any significance to the night? And you bet. The night was the Passover that they were celebrating. That is very significant. When celebrated, that one of the children would say, why is this night different than any other night? And usually the head of the home would say, this is the celebration of God's mighty deliverance of the nation from their bondage and slavery to their enemies in Egypt. The night of the Passover was a memorial. And you'll remember back, it's a memorial for the ten plagues that God brought upon Egypt through Moses. And the very last one was the slaying of the firstborn. Israel was to take a lamb and slay it and to put it on the doorposts. And then they were to feast upon the flesh of that lamb. And then that night, the death angel comes and it strikes all of the firstborn except blood on the doorpost. Those doors, no one was dead. The lamb dies instead of anyone in that home. And the death angel would just pass over that home. And then in Exodus 12, it was declared to be a perpetual meal to remember their liberation so Israel would never forget God's deliverance from their bondage and from their enemies. And now it is that night. Jesus is going to make some changes that only God can do. And during that Passover celebration, He is now going to institute something new. As they take the meal, He takes the bread. And look in verse 24. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And the same way He took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of Me. As they would now take this cup and this bread, uh, there was no lamb at the Last Supper. Isaiah knew, Isaiah knew, listen to what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53. But he, this person, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he, has taken, he was taken away. And as for his generation who consider that he was to be cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. So who is this Isaiah that you're writing about? Isaiah doesn't tell us. But all I know is those lambs in the Old Testament didn't take away sin. They pictured or they represented another substitute who would come who could take away sin in an eternal covenant. And so this night, the night, the Passover Jesus declares before those 12, it's me. It's, it's me. I'm the main course. My death is the climactic event of all of the history of salvation and what it's been pointing to. He had been promised and pictured since the fall, and this night he declares to them, it's me. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. I am the Lamb of God. Salvation from sin and from death. This is the night. So when we take the bread and the cup this morning, it brings our present to the past. And it unites us with Christ, our Passover, who was a type. The lamb was. And that lamb was to be without blemish in Exodus 12, 5. That lamb was to be roasted with fire. And Jesus would bear the wrath of a God who's a consuming fire. And in Exodus 12, 46, not a bone of that lamb was to be broken. So today, Christ is our Passover lamb, and our, our present is joined with the past. 
as we come to this table. Secondly, the table connects our hearts to Christ. And if you will, keep your hand in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to try to do the same thing. And turn over to John chapter 6. And the difference between Protestant and Catholic understanding of this, this is my body, is that they believe it turns into the literal body of Jesus being sacrificed again. And they come to John 6, where Jesus says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no life in yourself. And I think that it, John 6 is actually the teaching, the argument of the heart of what's going on at the communion table. And so what I would like to do is just kind of together, I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to read through. Uh, let's start in John 6, verse 28. The crowd said to Jesus, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. That is the work of God. Verse 30, They said therefore to Him, What then do you, do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? For our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. So the, all these guys want is some food. He'd already fed the 5,000, and they're trying to bait him to say, what do you do for a sign? Moses gave us manna, will you you make us some bread and fish again? That's all they're after. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down down out of heaven and he gives life to the world. The bread of heaven. They said, therefore, to him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. We want it. And Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but I raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. That is our absolute hope and glory. The Jews, therefore, were grumbling about him because he said, I'm the bread that comes down out of heaven. They're they're missing it. And they were saying, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say, I've come down out of heaven? He was born from Mary. Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise them up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that any man has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that the one who may eat it will not die if they eat this bread. I'm the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he's going to live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Communion table. Verse 52. The Jews therefore began to argue with one another saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Oneness. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also shall live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread is going to live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who who can listen to this stuff about eating bread and, and his body? But Jesus, conscious 
that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them so they won't miss it, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you should behold the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit in our life. Don't miss it. It's not eating the real physical flesh. It's the words that I have spoken that are spirit and they're life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Turn back to 1 Corinthians. In John 6.35, he tells us that, that to eat him is to believe and it's to come to him. What does it mean to eat and drink Jesus? Here I am, I'm bread and I'm drink. Have at me. Well, how? How do you satisfy your soul with Jesus? He says, come to me. Come to me and believe and I will satisfy you, your hearts, your souls. I will give you eternal life. I will, I will satisfy you. Believing is the issue, not eating literal flesh. It tells us clearly in John 6. Feeding upon the bread of life is by faith. Communing with Christ. In this book of John, he said, I'm living water. One who drinks of me will never thirst again. I'm a vine and you are branches. The one who abides in me will bear much fruit. This is a call to being satisfied with all that God is for us in Jesus Christ. The testimonies we just heard. I am so satisfied with what God is for me in Jesus Christ. I eat it, I drink it, I believe it, I come, I abide, it is life to me. This is a call to Christ. This is not just believing some words. Jesus says we're to feed upon them, we're to drink them, we're to delight in these words and to, to treasure them. This can't just be something academic. These are eyes that see and Jesus, Jesus satisfies my soul. I love that hymn, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus. And so I think the key to this whole ordinance then is to remember. It's not just let's eat some bread and drink some wine and do it in remembrance. I want to try to flush that out to get the fullness this morning. Is the English word to remember, when you hear that word, what comes to your mind? When I hear remember, I think, oh, I recall something. I, I remember where my keys are. I, I, I recall and I bring it back. But in the English, I want to look at this English word and this Greek word because I think it's the key of the whole table. English is the opposite. What's the opposite of remember? If you go back in the older English, it's to dismember. And to dismember means to cut off your hands or your feet, a member or your body part. To remember means to fuse it back or to graft, to take something that is part of your body and to remember it to your body. Has Christ so drifted from your heart has the scene drawn you in again to think life is here? This is to come back and remember. John 6, it's to eat and to drink His Word, to come back to the Gospel. It becomes a part of you. you. You remember it. The Lord's Supper is to remember Christ. He's your life. Christ is your hope of glory. He, he is your hands, your heart, your will. It's to come back. I am one with Jesus Christ. Remember. It is so sweet to take this time together and remember, I like the Greek word even more. It, it means to, to go to a past event and to, to bring it back in such a way that it, it, it affects the present. It, it, it gives life. It, it brings it fresh to you. And it's not just one event. It's the whole event that we get to gather today and remember. I get to remember the betrayal the greatest injustice on the face of this earth was the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, seeing him giving thanks to God at this meal who, who had planned every detail of his death. I thank you, Father. Him singing a song as he rises up at the end of this meal. Him breaking the bread to remember his body that would be broken for me. It's this whole event. Do this in remembrance of me, the cross event and all that is in this. There's so much for us at the table of God. It's a time for us to feed upon Christ, the living bread, the manna that came down from heaven. Bethlehem means that heaven's bread. Feed on it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Am I even on your radar this morning? Some of you academically, you're just saying, I, this guy's crazy. And this is what it means. Uh, I feed on Christ. I love him. I treasure him. I love what he's done for me. I love who he is. I'm one. I commune. I'm, I know him. And I just, I taste. And I see that he's good. So Christ connects our present to our past. He's our Passover lamb. Secondly, he connects our hearts to Christ. This is a time to remember Jesus. And thirdly, I think is very important, is that it, it connects us with each other. Uh, agape. This is a, a time of the oneness of the body of Christ, and it seems to be forgotten so much at the table. What, what's the context of 1 Corinthians 11? You don't have to yell it out or anything. The, the context... Uh, the, of the Lord's table is very interesting to me. Wouldn't you kind of expect Paul to teach on the Lord's table in a great context of worship, explaining the worship of the saints, all that's here? I, I just anticipate this, like the, like the Lord's Supper, what we're looking at in, in, in the Gospels. is It's just such a glorious event when he instituted it that I expect Paul to teach it from that. But strangely enough, this is coming up in, a, in an indictment of the moral mess that's going on at Corinth, right in the middle of all of this, Paul drops the table in. They're having disputes and factions. And in chapter 1, verse 12, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter. They're arguing over which one baptized them and who's their leader. And 3, 1 through 2, there, there's jealousy and strife among them. Chapter 5, there's immorality in their midst. Chapter 6, they're suing one another. Chapter 7, they've got all kinds of marriage problems. Chapter 9, they're talking about ministers. Chapter 11, head coverings, and then they're fighting over spiritual gifts. If there was anything to fight over, Corinth had it, they had it going. And so there's just all this division, and there's no surprise that they're making a mockery of the communion table. There's a love feast where they're coming, and they're, they're, they're eating, and people are coming and just chowing down, and there's drunkenness, and they're, they're mistreating the poor, and it's just they're, they're destroying the beauty of what we're looking at this morning. Look with me in verse 17 of chapter 11 of Corinthians. <clears throat> but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. I'm not going to praise you for what you're doing. It's actually hurting. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. That Greek word is schisms. There's schisms going on among you when you all gather, and, and in part, I, I believe it. It's not hard for me to believe that about Corinth. For there must also be factions among you. Why? For a purpose that those who are approved may become evident among you. Paul says there's actually a purpose in schisms, so the approved ones might come forth in those schisms. That's an interesting statement. Verse 20, therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another's drunk. So again, you're chowing down, and there's someone who's hungry, and you won't even share your sandwich. And another is drinking so much wine at it, they're, they're getting drunk. What, do you, have, do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? You're, you're shaming them. They're sitting there hungry and they're, they're embarrassed that they don't even have any food and you're just shaming them, chowing down right in front of them. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus. So I think the key of the whole Lord's table is verse 23, the connection four, is it's coming out of this whole argument then. This is where Paul's logicking. So here's what jumps out at me. If you were to ask these Corinthians, are you guys despising the church of God? What do you think they would say? No, we, we love the church. We just had a great meal and we had communion. Praise be to God. So you can actually come to church and sing and listen to a sermon and talk to some people and go home and be so out of touch that you don't even realize you're despising the church of God. Is it possible that I could be despising the church of God? I don't think what they were doing was intentional. I don't think. They're treating people in the church beneath what they really are. The body of Christ is the bride. It's the temple of God. Every person has value, eternal value, and we treat each other that way. We don't have the distinctions that the world makes. So you get together and you're wrapped up in your meal and your thirst, 
And you don't even see the poor. You don't even realize that they have no food. You're despising the church. You're humiliating the poor by making them look foolish when they've done nothing foolish at all. Shall I commend you for this? No. And then comes 4 in verse 23. I'm not going to commend you. 4. Here's the reason the Lord's Supper exists. This is not uh, teaching as worship, but this is teaching against lovelessness, the table. The Lord's Supper then is a call to love. It's an indictment to lovelessness and to the oblivion to those who are in need in your midst, not caring about them, walking by them, ignoring them, doing all the world's way of thinking about each other, that this is what the context of the Lord's table is. So when we eat it together, we love each other. This is the time to cherish the body of Christ like no other. I love the bride as I look what Jesus did for the bride. It just makes you, stimulates you to love and good works, doesn't it? You can't look at this table and, and not care about the person sitting next to you. You're breaking down the whole purpose. There's no power in just eating and drinking. <laughs> okay, I did it. You're missing the whole thing. I think the surest way to know that you have not tasted of this lamb, this redeemer, is that you don't love his bride. You don't love his body. You're apathetic to it, or maybe even more, you actively hurt it. Paul even says that some of you are sick and weak and even dying because of the way you're partaking of the Lord's table, which is this nasty spirit that they had. So God even brought chastisement upon his saints who are they're, 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 they're sinning against the body and they're abusing one another. And he's saying, this is why some of you might even be sick and dying. I, I will bring judgment upon you to, to waken you up. That's a powerful thing. You don't hear that a lot in sermons. If you're bitter and angry and divided and not talking to people, remember. Just remember. And it brings an instant healing to the body of Christ. So I see this as a big part of partaking of this worthily. Uh, look with me in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. So just catch this. It'll never be that you're worthy. It'll never be that, uh, okay, I, I've done good enough this week. I can come to the table. You've missed it. The whole gospel is you'll never be worthy. Jesus makes you worthy before God. So it isn't ever going to be how, how well you're doing and have I examined myself enough with every little sin. That is not what this is talking about. It's an unworthy manner. You're going to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself that he might eat of the bread and drink of the cup also. And so I think a worthy manner then is the first thing we see in verse 24 and 25 is a worthy manner is to see and to savor what the cup and the bread signify. It's a, it's, I, I come and I remember and there's, there's a treasure to me and a Christ who's been sacrificed for me. And so come, to come worthily is that Jesus is he's my Messiah, he's my Lamb, He's the one who has sacrificed for me. Secondly, I think it's to, refill, to feel remorse that our attitudes have been wrong uh, and unloving. I've, just, I've become unloving to the saints of God. I've become nasty, just bitter, grumpy, touchy. And it's a time then to renounce that and turn from it and to walk in love. I will not treat the church as cheap. And so the table is a time to Look at what Jesus has done and what he purchased and what we are and to just realize, am I despising the body of Christ? Is, is it just, I, I don't care about any of you. I get my sermon, I go home, and I don't care about anybody the rest of the week. That's despising the church of God. And then trust Jesus at this table to forgive and to give us fresh grace to walk in love, which is the fulfillment of the whole law that we would love one another. Amen? That's beautiful. Shoulder to shoulder. I get to see all your faces. You guys don't get that privilege. And it's just, I see the, and we get a, we're one. We get to remember together. We get to love one another and help each other on our way to glory. So this is, this is beautiful what happens at the table. And then lastly, it connects 
your life story to the future. So it connects your past, uh, the present to the past, connects you to Jesus Christ in a sweet way of feeding upon him, and it connects you to the body of Christ that brings healing to the unity and to the love and to what we have in him. And fourthly, it connects your life story to the future. Look with me in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so what I love about this is what, what's, what's happening this morning is we're preaching and proclaiming that he's coming again. He is coming soon for his bride, the bride that I love. He's coming soon to redeem it forever. And when he comes, it's interesting, he brings a supper. And in Revelation, it says we're going to come and there's going to be the wedding supper of the Lamb. Listen to it. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. It's going to be beautiful. And he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You could not be more blessed than to be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I get a picture of that this morning. And he said to me, these are true words of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. That's the only response. And he said to me, do not do that. I'm sorry, that's the only response to Jesus. Do not do that, for I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So Jesus says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to make all things new. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth and I'm going to wipe away every tear, the curse, everything. There'll be no more sorrow. The gate's always going to be open because we'll have no enemies. There's just eternal, perfect peace. And it begins with that supper of the Lamb. Tears are going to be gone. There'll be no more suffering or even the fear of it. But your heart will be completely satisfied for all of eternity. Do you know that you'll never feel emptiness again? For, forever. This morning... These elements are hors d'oeuvres of your future to feast upon Jesus for all of eternity. His words forevermore in our hearts. So this table connects our present with our past because of the Paschal Lamb, Jesus Christ, sacrificed for us. It connects us with Jesus as we do this in remembrance of Him and we just remember and we rejoice and we bring it all to heart again and we feed upon the bread of heaven. This is a, a banquet. Thirdly, it connects us with each other. This picture is something so beautiful from every tribe, tongue, and nation. We got people from all walks of life. And there's a oneness here that is so beautiful in Christ. And we, we shore up uh, schisms, hurts, unforgiveness. Brokenness. This is a time of letting those things go as you remember. And fourthly, it connects us to our future, that he's coming again. And oh, what he has in store for those who have loved him. It's going to be beautiful. It'll be an all-you-can-eat buffet for all of eternity. I love it. I love it so. I heard a preacher share this illustration in closing. He was talking about old Pippin. Uh, Pippin and the Lord of the Rings. And he hears this, this distant horn, and the knights ride in to the rescue, and they save all the people and save and rescue the city. And in the book, not in the movie, uh, Pippin could never hear a horn, it said, out in the distance the rest of his life without breaking into tears. It always brought back to him the memory of that deliverance and what had happened. And so that horn connected him to his past and all the sacrifice that was given in that great war. And all of his life then was a testimony of grace. And so to me, the, the table is a horn uh, for us to remember the Paschal Lamb and what he has done. And I, I can never get over it. I just could look my eyes out forever at Jesus. And so I want you to remember. I want you to remember that Christ was offered to God as a sacrifice. And now he has returned to us as a banquet that we might feed on the bread of heaven together this morning. And when I think of our 18 years together, for those of you who started with us, this is really what it means to me. 
this morning. Eighteen years of feasting on the Paschal Lamb together. Just being satisfied with all that God is for us in Jesus Christ. And with all of our being, seeking to make him known to our families and our communities and to the nations in every way that we can. This is what this church means to me. This is the beauty of what I see and what I've experienced. I I love my son standing up here, and this is where he got saved, and this is where he's grown, and this is where he's been loved. And you haven't treated him like a pastor's kid. You, you've loved him. And he, you know, he, I asked him, not one time in 18 years did anyone ever say, oh, that's the pastor's kid. You know, and just, you guys have loved him. And you've loved us. And you've loved each other. And it's been a place where, where we could grow up in Christ. And it's been a place where we can die well. Every one of our saints who have died breathed their last, loving the Lord Jesus Christ and entered into glory. And it's just, this is a great place. Our people die well. You want to die well, this is the group. They, they sing to you, they preach, they keep your eyes looking at Jesus the whole time till you quit breathing and behold your reward. And that's what this means to me. And that's why this is such a special morning for your old pastor, one of them. So in the gratefulness to our God, let us remember together as one. And let's have a time, a song of just to meditate upon I'm going to pray while they come up. Father, thank you. I love the Lord's table. And just in studying this week, you made it even sweeter to my own heart. I pray that all of us now, Lord, as we just come and remember, let it be sweet. Let every individual saint now corporately just uh, look upon you and remember all that you did to bring us to yourself, to bring you to bring us to the Father and to be bread that we can feed upon. God, I thank you for your words are life, and we treasure them, and we eat them, and we love them even here this morning, and I pray this in Christ's name, amen.